Good evening. Welcome and thank you for tuning in to this evening's panel as part of the Word on the Street Toronto 2021 Festival, our 32nd annual and second fully virtual. I'm Sarah Dunn, President of the Watts Board of Directors and tonight's host. We are excited to be presenting Even So, a conversation with Lauren B. Davis discussing her newest release. Before we dive into our discussion, we need to recognize the land we occupy. The Toronto of today exists because of the Toronto Purchase, also known as Treaty 13, signed with the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation in 1805 with a final claim settlement in 2010. Watts Toronto also recognizes the history of the Anishinaabeg, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, the Huron-Wendat, and the Seneca Nations in this territory. The place in which Watts operates is the subject of the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Belt Covenant, an agreement to take care for and share the resources around the Great Lakes in peace. Toronto, or Tikaronto, is now home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit, and Métis peoples with long histories on this land. And acknowledging this is only the first step in building a practice of land stewardship and Indigenous solidarity that honors these peoples. We encourage you to educate yourself about the land you occupy wherever you're tuning in from. Just a few announcements before we introduce tonight's panelists. Don't forget to sign up for our upcoming panels. This is day four of our 10 day festival celebrating storytelling, ideas and imagination. Earlier today, we streamed Hopeful Apocalypse, climate fiction for the cautious optimist, as well as our panel, Epistolary Fiction, Letters of Hope and Heartbreak, both of which can now be found on our YouTube channel, The Word on the Street. For information on our upcoming panels, visit our website, toronto.wordonthestreet.ca. If you want to be the first to know about new videos from The Word on the Street, please subscribe to our YouTube channel, where you'll find all the panels from this year's festival. And if you enjoy tonight's talk, please give this video a like to help others find it as well. Now I'm pleased to welcome our moderator for this panel, Deborah Dundas. Deborah Dundas is the books editor at the Toronto Star and has a deep background in the media. This background includes stints in business, lifestyle, and national and city politics in television and in newspapers in Canada and while working and living in Northern Ireland. And our guest for this evening is Lauren B. Davis. Lauren is the author of The Grimoire of Kensington Market, Against a Darkening Sky, The Empty Room, our Daily Bread, and The Radiant City. She has been longlisted for the Giller Prize and the Relit Awards and shortlisted for the Writers' Trust Fiction Prize. Lauren lives in Princeton, New Jersey. Thank you both for joining us this evening. Thanks, Sarah. Thanks, Sarah. Thanks very much. <laughs> and hello, Lauren. So nice to Hi, Deborah. be here with you at Word on the Street. I think for the second time, First time was a few years ago on a mystery. It was. Panel, you're absolutely right. Yeah. Although that was in person, I remember I have vague memories of in person. I know. I know. I can't wait till we get back to that again. But meantime, thank goodness we can get together through technology. Um, the first thing I wanted to do in talking about even so was ask you to situate the book and maybe do a, a short reading. Not everybody might uh, might have read the book already. And uh, I think it's always frustrating if they don't, they're not quite sure what sure. we're talking about. So if yeah. you could do that, Absolutely. that would be wonderful. So um, Even So is about two women, uh, a Princeton um, woman in her, in her 40s of enormous privilege, I must say, and a Catholic nun who runs a food pantry down in Trenton, which is about, down, about nine miles down the road from where I live here in Princeton. Um, and the book is really about what, what, it's the difference between passion and compassion. That's that's at play throughout the whole novel, as is this question of how do we love difficult people? How do we love ch challenging people? It's easy to love people who've been harmed, for example, but it's much harder to love those who have done harm. Um, and yet, isn't that what we're being asked to do? Not to use love as merely a reward for good behavior, 
but in fact, as a tool, as a transformational tool for mutual healing. So those, those, it's just a little bit about the women. So I thought that I'd read um, a little bit, it's very short, about five, six minutes, just to give you a sense of who these women are and what they're doing. We begin. Princeton was mowed lawns and cocktails on the terrace and fundraisers for the library. It was, for want of a better word, pleasant, that white bread word. Trenton had a wild beat. It was hot blooded. It was street art and sirens and all the insistent urgency of survival on the edge of a falling knife. Philip had asked Angela once why she was so fascinated with Trenton. But it wasn't the place, it was the people, the difference between Princetonians who rolled through life on golden wheels and Trentonians who clambered up mountains cursing sharp stones. The untamed necessity of life in Trenton, opposed to the complacent luxury of Princeton, that's what drew her. Trenton had no facade. That had been down, torn down years ago. It didn't bother dressing up. Angela liked herself there. She felt that throb in her veins when she welcomed the poor and the hungry into the pantry and filled their bags with nourishment. The pantry doors opened at 9.30 a.m. It was closer to 10 by the time Angela parked the car and headed for the door. The March wind blew sharp and smelled of gasoline and garbage. By then, a few early people had been and gone. A small group of women stood gossiping by the door. None of their jackets looked warm enough. Inside, Roxy greeted her. I'm sorry, Angela said, I'm a little late. Accident on Route 1. Oh, as dear. Ah, dear, said Roxy. I guess the others got here before it happened. Lucky them. She turned to greet a new shopper at the door. A young nun sat behind the intake desk by the door. Angela walked over and apologized again for her tardiness and explained about the accident. Well, I'm glad you're here now. Can you take over? Angela slipped out of her coat, hung it over the chair, and held out her purse. Sister Carolyn, it is Carolyn, right? Can you pop this in the office for me? Thanks. Three people were already shopping, and Sister Eileen stood chatting with them, laughing at something. Like many nuns, judging Eileen's age was difficult. What was it about nuns? The fact they wore no makeup? That they seemed to smile more than they frowned? That they spent so much time in prayer and meditation? Or was Angela simplifying, romanticizing? Possibly. Sister Eileen looked about Angela's age. Well, whatever age, she was a whirlwind of energy in a pastel cardigan and comfortable shoes. Sister Eileen was stout, with hair starting to turn gray, and her voice held the rhythms and nasal honk of the Jersey Shore, but she radiated a kind of calm. Angela often had the impression she was one of those people who might actually have had an experience of God somehow. She seemed to exist in two worlds at once and always saw the bigger picture. One felt both humbled and hopeful around Sister Eileen. She smiled at Angela and gave her a little salute before turning back to the shoppers. The room was set up to look as much as possible like a small market. The intake desk where Angela sat was the first stop for clients. She took down their particulars for the database, name, address, income, number of people in the household. She tried to get a sense of other needs, counseling, medical care, computer education, social services of various sorts. She preferred this task since she liked talking to people and was curious about them. The 83 year old woman who lived on $600 a month, social security and whatever her daughter could give her. The father of four who'd been laid off his job as maintenance worker in one of the pharmaceutical companies and hadn't been able to find anything else yet. The grandmother raising three of her grandchildren. Angela patted hands and gave out hugs. She dandled kids on her knee and didn't care about sticky fingers on her old jeans. She left her jewelry at home, even her wedding band, for it would have been unkind to flaunt those diamonds. She saw herself as the gracious girl with the soft hands, soothing, listening, brightening people's lives with her sympathy, her concern, and occasionally a little harmless flirting. 
She was making a difference in the lives of the marginalized, rewarded with smiles and being known by name. Hey, Miss Angela, how you doing? She was, unironically, Lady Bountiful. If she was aware of her self-regard, her self-concern, her self-congratulation, well, she rationalized that didn't lessen the good she was doing. Daryl was 22, tall and gangly. He wore low slung jeans, a white t-shirt and a track suit jacket with black stripes on the sleeves. Angela was filling out the usual information. His clothes included no color, so he wasn't identifying with a gang. She checked colors and tattoos out of habit. Bloods wore red, Crips blue, Latin Kings black and gold. Nettas were red, white, and blue. How many in the family, Daryl? I'm here for my grandmother, right? You know her, Leonetta West. She said you know her. Oh, sure, Miss West. She all right? Miss West cared for a few children, four, five, sometimes six. Her diabetes kicking up, legs all swollen, so she can't walk good. That's nice of you to help. You living there now? Yeah, for a while, till I get my own place. Reading between the lines, it was probable Daryl had been recently released from a halfway house from prison. The percentage of young men in Trenton who had done time was obscene, but Angelo had long ago learned that simply because someone had been to jail didn't make them a bad person. In fact, most of the time, almost all the time, their moral center was no different than hers or anyone else's she knew. It was just that the rules were different here. Kids grew up with a set of street rules foreign to her experience, but a code of conduct nonetheless. Living up to that code made moral sense for the people who grew up with it. There were all kinds of criminals, and she'd met some supposedly upstanding members of the financial community who had committed crimes with considerably far more, reach more far-reaching effects than those committed on these streets. I'm sure Ms. West is grateful to have you with her. She can certainly use the help. Daryl pushed up the sleeves of his jacket, revealing a homemade tattoo on his forearm that read, Dollars Before Bitches. She couldn't help but laugh. He jerked his chin. What? She tapped his arm. How's your love life? He looked puzzled for a second and then broke out in a sheepish grin. Yeah, young and stupid, right? Got like when I was 14, you know, thought I knew everything. I'm saving up. I'm going to have it laze it off. I know a dermatologist who, who removes drug tattoos, gang tattoos, does it for free. Daryl dropped his eyes. Nope. Uh, I don't know. I just thought wrong of, wrong of me to ask. Sure. He shuffled in his seat, put his hands on his knees, about to stand. We good. Absolutely. The flush rose in Angela's cheeks. She handed him his shopping cart. Daryl smirked and strolled off, wrapped in his eloquent, eloquent silence. Angela's impulse was to run after him, to tell him he was wrong about her, to persuade him she was without judgment. But Daryl's insight was a flashbulb revealing all sorts of flaws. And I'll stop there. Thank you very much. Um, we get a sense of um, both Eileen, Sister Eileen, and Angela in, in that reading. Um, now, the, the book goes between Angela mm -hmm. and Eileen, Sister Eileen. How did you come to understand that these would need to be the two main characters and that you were going to structure it like that? Well, I think, you know, with all writers, I think, tend to write about things that obsess us, that are bugging us, that are that are annoying us, shall we say. And... Um, I've I've been I had been thinking for a long time about this idea of caring for people who are very difficult to care for, very difficult to care about. Here comes the dog. Um, and I happen to know this woman who is a Catholic nun, Sister Rita. She's a member of the Sisters of St. Joseph. And we she and I had had long conversations about uh, some of the difficult people in my own life and and how wrestling with that kind of an angel uh, is transformational. And I loved this idea that she that she had about, you know, the idea of wrestling with the angel of Jacob and the angel and how it's only when we're in that kind of wrestling posture with something that's difficult that uh, bends us into shapes that we might not otherwise 
find ourselves in. And that's where growth happens. That's where any sort of transformation happens. Um, and then I also started thinking about, you know, as I say, I live in Princeton, which is nine miles down the road from Trenton. And the two worlds could not be more different. Uh, and there's very little mixing, really, between the worlds. Um, <laughs> You know, and I've worked. I've worked down at the. Uh, I, you know, I've taught in prisons here, and I've worked at the at the Trenton Soup Kitchen here. And I'm always surprised when some of my neighbors say that they that they're shocked that I would go to Tren that I would go to Trenton, and I'd say, "Well, what are you talking about? It's you. You can walk there from here." Um, but the idea is that it's just not. It's not safe. It's not us. It's not. It's them. And you know, I think you you know some of the other books that I've written. And so you know that I'm often talking about people who are marginally poor, but also mm -hmm. on the margins of things. What is it that causes us to view our neighbor as the other, as those people? And so Sister Eileen, uh, this, the, this idea of a Catholic nun who, who so easily transcends both these worlds seemed to me to be the perfect vehicle uh, to explore that sort of thing. You know, the Sisters of St. Joseph, they have this, uh, their maxim is to, to, and I'm not even Catholic, by the way, but I'm, I learned about this stuff, um, that their maxim is um, to, uh, to meet the dear neighbor without distinction, to love the dear neighbor without distinction. And that to me seemed really important. It's that without distinction, right? Easy to say, not so easy to do. Well, that's... And so it couldn't be easy for Eileen, right? I mean, if it was easy for Eileen, there wouldn't be a story. So there also had to be something. It had, you know, she's challenged by, she's challenged by uh, Angela. You know, mm -hmm. Angela pushes all her buttons. And and frankly, it's hard to blame her. <laughs> well, it is. Um, it Angela's is. difficult. Yeah. She's difficult to like. She's got everything, and she's still not happy. Well, I think you know. Of course, you know, being the author, you know, I quite mm -hmm. like Angela. Right. Um, I made her up. Therefore, I like her. But I also I, you know, I like her because of her passion. I mm. like her because she wanted to take these great lusty bites out of life yeah. that she, in fact, is not satisfied and complacent with all the trappings. Right. That mm -hmm. to me would actually be an unlikable character. Somebody who just sat back on their laurels and and saw no reason to question or to be hungry about things. So, you know, for me, Angela is not unlikable. She's challenging. And I'm not saying that I don't yeah. believe that she makes the right choices mm -hmm. in the way she goes about trying to to fill those hollow spaces in herself. But I actually do find her quite likable, find her quite fascinating. I mean, it's it's interesting because middle-aged women, I mean, she's, what, 45, I think, um, yeah. says in the book, um, tend to be pretty invisible and seen as not particularly sexual. And she is certainly anything but not sexual. Um, yeah, she is not having that. <laughs> she is not. And, um, you know, passion is, is what defines, and we're talking about sexual mm -hmm. passion too, not mm -hmm. just a, a passion for life, a passion for physicality um, mm -hmm. really informs, informs. Well, a lot I of think that's the, that's how, that's what she finds, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't think that that's the, that, that's, I don't actually think that's what she's looking for. It's what mm -hmm. she thinks she's looking for. Yeah. Yeah. And, and so she finds Karsten. She does. She does. Um, how much fun was it writing the wooing scenes and the sex scenes? Yeah, well, you know, I'm an old lady, so <laughs> <laughs> so I know a thing or two is what I'm saying here. Um, yeah, I mean, it, you know, it is fun to write. It's always fun to write about about lust and passion and sex. It's, you know, it's always fun to write about those things. And, you know, and he's an interesting character, you know, because Karsten, too, is, you know, again, he's he's a guy. I, I love Karsten. I, I find him completely irresistible. But he's not, you know, he's Peter Pan in some ways, yeah. right? I mean, you know, he's, if we're looking at that sort of Jungian archetype of the, of, you know, the boy who doesn't want to grow up, that in some ways is Karsten. And that makes him all the more alluring 
to a woman who is looking for this 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 spontaneity, this passion for life. Um, and you know, again, he's not you know he's not a bad guy. Um, you know, he's he wants to be a good person. All of these people want to be good people. Uh, they want more from life than they than they have, of course, and this is the way they they try and find it. While I, Sister Eileen, you know, who has her own struggles, is on the sidelines, you know, watching this. You'll you'll pardon me, a car wreck. Um, yeah, you know, coming at everybody, and and yet there's very little that she can do to to stop it. Right. And all she can do is hold space and be for be there for people when when they find themselves in impossible postures. Mm -hmm. Which is, you know, what what she's trying to tell Angela in some ways about about God. Um, now, you know, this book is very much. About. About how they see God. Um, mm -hmm. It's not very fashionable these days to write about about God and about religion. Why did you? Well, honey, to if do we only that? wrote about what was fashionable, there'd only be one book out every year, right? That's right. Um, you know, again, and I mean, I think, you know, I think whatever whatever comes to a writer um, as sort of the metaphor for what's bugging them is is what I believe you have a responsibility to go with. Uh -huh. um, you know, as I said, I'm not Catholic, um, and you know, I I I have an enormous amount of respect for the Catholic nuns I know, um, who I also think they're very interesting women because they they they're not traditional. You know, I mean, I don't know anything about nuns. I didn't grow up with nuns. I didn't grow up with the church, so I I you know don't have much of a, of a history to draw on there. Uh, but I did go and and stay with them for a while, a group of nuns. And Was that at the were... Sisters at the St. Raphaela Retreat? They, yes, they, yeah. They, they, they figure really large in your acknowledgments. I was going to ask about that. Oh, my God. Well, these women work. I mean, it's crazy. I mean, they, you know, a, a number of the nuns are certainly older than I am. Uh, I am I, there were only a couple who were younger. You know, like they're up at five o'clock every morning. They're scrubbing pots. They're cleaning bathrooms. They're making. It's unbelievable the work that they do. And and they do it all while praying for the dear neighbor. I mean, you know, they're scrubbing at that pot and they're they're not listening to me chatter on because they're actually putting spirituality into what they do. So so that I found I found really fascinating. And I love I mean, these are I don't know whether you know about the nuns on the bus. There's this group of nuns they call the nuns on the bus and they're activist nuns. You know, they get on this bus and they show up where things are, are tough, where horrible things are happening to do what must be done, right? Whether it's to, you know, to feed the poor, to clean the kids, to, you know, they work on the border. There's an incredible center at the border for immigrants um, mm -hmm. where they get dumped. And, you know, these people are frightened and they're hungry and they're lonely and they're, you know, they're, they're exhausted and they've been abused. And, you know, and there are these women who just no questions asked, what do you need? Let's get them socks and underwear and food for the kids and a bed to sleep. And, you know that that so that that sort of presented itself as the way to tell the story, much in the same way that when I was writing the grimoire of Kensington Market, which was mm -hmm. about the suicide yep. death of my brothers, uh, and I couldn't find a way to write that in realistic fiction. It was the Snow Queen. It was the you know Hans Christian Andersen fairy tale. It was that structure that presented itself as a way for me to tell the story. Mm -hmm. So in this book, this is what presented itself. Um, and I don't care much about fashionable. I got to tell you, I, you know, I just, I'm too old for fashionable. Don't, you know, don't I've been doing you. this for too long. <laughs> and I, if I have to write a book that's in fashion, uh, then I'm just going to, I'm just not, I'm just not, we're just not going to do that because I can't imagine spending years working on something that's, that's in vogue rather than something that's really deeply meaningful to me. And, and that's, that's what this was now. The grimoire of Kensington as well. I mean, it uses myths to look at addiction and family, and and even so, addiction family are also major themes. Those two major themes. Why why do you come back to these themes? 
Well, I think, you know, again, it's, you know, it's what happened. It's what, it's what you, you, it's what lingers in the, mm -hmm. in the marrow of a person. And I will say that I don't think that, um, I don't think that there is uh, alcoholism in the, in this book. I, I think that there is situational alcoholic abuse. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, and there, and there is a different, you know, those, I mean, you know, I'm in recovery. I think everybody pretty much knows I'm in recovery. I've been in recovery for a long time. Um, you know, and there are some people who go through really awful times and they drink too damn much and they make stupid decisions and they do bad things. And then things change and they stop and they go on with their lives, kind of like college, you know, your college <laughs> years, right? And then there are those of us who start then and we just never stop and, and you know, we can't stop. And I suspect that Angela is of the first version, not the second. Well, it was interesting because without any spoilers, um, I, I, I was curious about that because I, there's one point where something happens mm -hmm. and she stops drinking. Right. Um, and she just stops. She doesn't even want yeah. to drink. And I thought, yeah. huh, how is that going to play out? Because of exactly what you're saying. I mean, there's yeah. we, we see enough about alcoholism um, to know that that might be a little bit of a different approach. Well, in fact, I, as I say, I don't think she's an alcoholic. Mm -hmm. I don't think she's an alcoholic. I, th I think I, I think she's somebody who's been abusing alcohol. Um and 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 gets the wake up call of a lifetime. But you know, even having said that, I mean, I you know, I've met people who, you know, there was a woman I met uh, years ago who uh, she burned her house down with her children Jesus. in it. Her, oh. Yeah, her two children were in the house, and uh, it they... was an accident. It was an accident. They died. The children died. Okay. Um, and and you know, she never touched alcohol again. Uh, she was an alcoholic. All right. But she just never touched alcohol again. And I, you know, I know a number of those stories. I know people who've woken up, uh, you know, not remembering that they called the police because they were going to commit suicide and the cops are standing over them. And, you know, it's some, it does sometimes happen that people, something happens where they get what we call a moment of clarity and they just stop drinking. Yeah, uh, That wasn't, that wasn't the case for me. Um, I need, I needed, uh, you know, I, I needed help from the outside, but it isn't the case for everybody. Mm -hmm. And as I say, there's a, I, th I believe there's a difference between people who situationally abuse alcohol uh, or uh, I don't know about other drugs, really alcohol is my thing, um, yeah. you know, and those who actually have an, an addiction to it. It's, it's interesting because she uses it as a little escape from the everyday almost, you know, and also mm -hmm. to, as, as, as a crutch to be able to allow her to, you know, stay in this yeah. hollow life that she doesn't really want to be in. And I think she romanticizes it. I mean, I think there's, you know, there's quite a lot that Angela romanticizes, um, but interestingly, she doesn't always romanticize herself. No, you know, she has she has more insight into herself, I think, than uh, than than some people might. And I think that's one of her great redeeming features. Is you know when she's behaving badly, uh, and it, she often knows she's behaving badly. She just doesn't want to stop yet. You know, she even when she's having arguments with her husband. You know, there's there's a moment when she says, you know, uh, a good person would not be doing what I'm doing right now. Yeah. yeah you know, she certainly. knows it. Right, she knows it. Uh, and I think she, that's one of the things that makes her interesting. Um, another thing I thought was interesting <clears throat> is she seems to blame herself for being a terrible mother. Um, so there's this idea of nurturing and mothering that that comes up her with her own child hood with her husband's childhood mm -hmm. and then with the way she deals with her her own child connor um yeah i'm not so sure she that? sees herself as a bad mother mm -hmm. i'm not, i i think she thinks she gets a little sloppy around it around the edges but i think she feels her love for connor her son who's you know off to university um mm -hmm. which you know she doesn't really talk about very much right i mean there is no. this moment when you know he's you know, he's about to leave home and she's just left with Philip, who also isn't a bad guy. He's just he's just not the guy for her. Um, but she doesn't look at that. That's the one thing she sort of doesn't 
sit down and say to herself, I wonder if I'm going through this because my son is is going away. I mean, albeit that he's been at a boarding school, so he comes and goes. Um, and she isn't as as needed as she might be. But she, you know, she adores him. And I think she, you know, she's one of these people who thinks that love will get her through everything. If there's just more love, that that will get her through everything. But she doesn't understand that that love has to be backed up by, you know, by love is a verb, you know, to quote that old phrase, right? That you mm -hmm. have to do something with that. Well, it's interesting. I mean, with, with the epigraph um, to, to the novel being from Raymond Carver and, and the title, you know, um, and did you get what you wanted from this life? Even, Even so, so, I did. And what yeah. did you want? To call myself beloved, to feel myself beloved on the earth. Hmm. Feeling, being beloved isn't always what we think it's going to be. No, it's not. And I think, uh, you know, somebody, it's interesting, somebody recently called this book a fairy tale in reverse. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, rather than getting your three wishes, <laughs> you, get, you get entirely different things. And yet they seem to be ultimately uh, what make up, what make the difference in a life. And I think that that's, you know, that's something that Eileen knows. She knows that, that the, the, the longings here are cravings for something else, for this sense of being beloved. I mean, if you, you know, if you really understand that you are beloved on this earth, what are you craving then? Right? What is there? What is there to crave? Uh, you you are filled then. That hollow is gone. And I think what Eileen struggles with, of course, is, is, you know, what she calls the silence of God, you know, that great yeah. dark night of the soul where you believed in something and it doesn't seem to be believing back at you. You know, you can't feel it. You can't hear it anymore. And so she's, you know, that's why Angela is also her relationship with Angela also heals her because mm -hmm. in loving this woman who she finds so reckless, so careless. You know, there's that line in the book, she was so reckless with all the fragile things she held. Yes. You know, Angela is so reckless, so careless with these things. And yet, you know, Eileen, who tries to be so very caring and so very ordered in her care of other people, if she can learn to love this person who is doing sort of everything the wrong way, as far as Eileen would be concerned. Concerned, yeah then doesn't that, doesn't, even this person can be beloved, even this person is beloved. Mm -hmm. You know, years ago, I remember watching this film, Bad Lieutenant. Um, I don't know whether you remember, it was with Harvey Keitel. There have been two versions. One was with Nicolas Cage. It was dreadful. Do not watch that one. Okay. But the one with, but the one with Harvey Keitel mm -hmm. is about this cop who is about the worst human being you could imagine. You can think of anything and this is the guy who did it, right? Dreadful human being. Can't even talk about it. I'm not, I mean, it's just so awful. Mm -hmm. And uh, there is a young nun who is raped, gang raped. And he wants to go and get the guys who did it. And the young nun says, no, don't do that. Because I've never met anyone who needed love more than these boys. Wow. And it's just, really? Right. And, 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 you know, Kaitel being Kaitel in this, you know, it's, it's just he cannot deal with this. It, this cracks open his world in every way possible. He cannot cope with this. It's, and yet it's that wrestling with that, with this impossible thing. Right. This impossible thing. Even this person is beloved. Even the person who has done this is beloved. Well, then I guess I, there must be space for me to be beloved, too. Yeah. Now, it, 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 there's a, a scene, I mean, near the, near the beginning in, in the prison. Um, I think it's the opening scene, isn't it? In the, in the correctional facility. Um, and then, you know, there's various scenes in prison late, later on. But um, what, was, what was it about the idea of, of people in the prison system that intrigued you? I mean, from what we're talking about there, is it the idea of redemption, the idea of a second chance? These all well, sort of it, dovetail it, together. It, it is. It's those things. I mean, as I say, mm -hmm. I've, you know, I've taught in prisons and, um, mm -hmm. you know, they're never what you think, right? The people who are in prison are not, I don't know what, I don't, I don't know what you think about people who are in prison, but, but they're not what most people think when they think of 
somebody who's incarcerated. How and, long have you um, volunteered? Who do you, who do you who do you see? Yeah. And, and well, I start I yeah. started going with an organization called PD Green, uh, which sends in uh, tutors uh, into into prisons. And mm-hmm. I said, well, you know, I don't really do math or anything. Um, you trust me, you do not want me teaching math to anyone, <laughs> um, nor science. None of this will work. But I can do this one thing. I can I can you know, help people be better writers. So I agreed, and I went in and and did that. Uh, and you know, one of one of the things that that struck me repeatedly, as I said in the in the passage that I read, is that the moral center of somebody in prison is, generally speaking, absolutely no different than mine. It's just they live in a in a world where the rules are different. Yeah. Right. Um, you know, with some obvious notable exceptions. I mean, you know, prisons are there for a reason, quite frankly. Um, but I'm sorry, Deborah. What, what, what no, the, it was the, the idea. It's the idea of redemption. Yeah. It's the idea yeah. of redemption. Yeah. So uh, you know, first of all, of course, it, it, so it is partly the idea of redemption. It's also the idea that there are that the world is so different for people who are incarcerated. I mean, you know, the the you walk into the prisons here, and uh, you know, it's like oh, everybody is somebody of color. It's like there are so few white people in the prisons. Where are all the white people? I know yeah. there are white criminals. Where the hell are the white criminals, right? Yep. But you, you don't, you just, it's just so awful. It's this, you know, prison, you know, prison pipeline, as they call it. Um, mm. And I find that unacceptable. And I find the, I find the judgments that people make, um, you know, when they, on people, when they get out of prison, I mean, they can't get jobs. I mean, it, it's, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's really, really hard time. It's very, very hard times. Um but having said that, I think part of what I'm I'm talking about in this book is the idea of what why do we give some people so much slack, yeah, and why do others get none at all, and how do we keep that line of conversation open between people? All right. So when Sister Eileen is in the prison, she has an encounter with with a young man there and what he's trying to accomplish. And then there's this this uh, this nun, of course, who is the chaplain there. Um, and I, you know, I I had did some research with the woman who's the the nun who's the chaplain at the at Edna McMahon prison here for women um, down here in New Jersey. And you know these are these are hard things to go through. These you know the the women who were in these penitentiaries, um, a lot of them in fact are there because not because they've necessarily done something, although many of them have, um, but often because the men in their lives have done something, and yeah. they take you know they take responsibility for that um, because they know that the guys will do harder time than they will. It's it, I mean these are all incredibly complicated issues, um, but they this is also I wanted a sense of the different worlds that Eileen. Sister Eileen moves in and mm-hmm. the ease which which she does that. And when you think of these nuns, you see how like what this network is of women who feed the poor, you know, deal with the prisons, you know, deal, help with the mothers, you know, do all of these different things. And they all they all connect up um, in this net that doesn't let anybody fall through if they can help it. Not mm-hmm. even the pri- privileged woman from Princeton, not even her there's redemption for her um, redemption relies on forgiveness in a lot of ways it seems to me in the book do you see it that way um i think i think i think forgiveness is part of redemption mm-hmm. i think uh but i don't think that you know, well, forgiveness again it's a very complicated issue i mean mm-hmm. there have been people that i have had to forgive in my life um not because i plan on hanging out with them I don't ever again, thank you. But because I don't want those fish hooks stuck in my skin. As long as I don't mm-hmm. forgive somebody for what they've done to me, um, I, I'm attached to them, right? Yeah. It's pulling at me all the time. So forgiveness lets me snip that fish line and and let it go, lets me drop the rock, if you will, and, and move on mm-hmm. past it. Um, but when it comes to forgiveness of the self, Yes, that's something that is a step toward redemption. I can't offer anybody else redemption. 
right? That has to come from inside themselves. And, uh, and, and how do you, how do you find redemption for yourself? If you can't forgive yourself, if you can't forgive yourself, it, how can you find forgiveness if you don't become accountable? Mm -hmm. right? Life it's becomes yeah. really simple when you can stand up and say, yeah, I did that thing. I, I did that thing. A lot of it's about personal responsibility and so many it is. of with with all of the characters, they all have their own, you know, Philip Carson, everybody has something that yeah. they've sort of let go in terms of personal responsibility and accountability. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I think we all do, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, and I don't who among us has not been in that position. Yeah, none of us. I have a question here from mm. um, let me see who it's from. It's uh not sure. Uh, Lauren, was there anything that surprised you about the book when you were in the writing process? Um, I think I think it surprised me. You know, I, again, I don't want to give too much away uh -huh. about what happens in the book, so it's kind of a difficult question to answer because. I mean, there was a lot that surprised me in the research, you know, particularly with these sisters I hung out with. But in terms of the writing of the book itself, um, in some ways, it was a much gentler book than I thought it was going to be. Ah. I thought it was going to be hard, more harder edged than it was. And it turned out and, and that, again, was the influence of Sister Eileen. Her influence was was through, you know, her character, you know, sort of influenced the way that went. Um, mm -hmm. Thank goodness. Uh, but I think there's, there's also something about relationships that, that I learned as I was writing the book, which came as a surprise, that it was the way these people were in relationship to each other or they weren't that, 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 made, that made the trans, whatever transformation is there possible or it didn't. It's when we, when people stayed in relationship, even when mm -hmm. being in those relationships was messy and uncomfortable, even when, you know, you thought you might get a door slammed in your face for, for trying to, to maintain a relationship or begin one. That's where all of the magic happened, if you want. Mm -hmm. And I think that surprised me how, how far down the line in every direction that thing, that one thing was true. Mm -hmm. Now, did you always know where, where this novel was going, where Angela was going? I mean, we don't want to give any spoilers, but did you did you know how this was going no, to end up? No, it started out. It started out a number of years ago quite differently. It, it started out. Um, it started out as a book about a crime, oh. and um, and and you know, and a nun who was going to. Um, have to find a way in herself to forgive an unforgivable crime. And then, but, and that, that became, it became a political, I knew I was going to, that was going to be a very, very political book. And I didn't really want to write a political book. I wanted to write uh -huh. a book about, about relationship and about, um, about this idea of feeling beloved or not, because that, uh -huh. that prayer, that prayer, and it is sort of a prayer to me, that poem of Raymond Carver's yes. has stuck with me for decades. You know, it just, I carry it around, you know, in my, in my wallet with me. I have it written out in a little piece of paper. Well, Lauren, I think that brings us, believe it or not, we've been uh, doing this for 45 minutes and uh, <laughs> it's, <laughs> We're we're at an end. We could we could go on for quite a while yet, but um, well, there coffee's we are. on me next time I come to Toronto, and we can keep going. That sounds good. We'll we'll do some yeah. chatting now. I think uh, is it uh, Yali who's uh, there? She is. She's Hello. popping up to do the the outro. Yes. Thank Hi, you Yali. both so much, Deborah, for your thoughtful questions, and Lauren for your incredibly thoughtful answers. It was a joy to listen Thanks to so you Thanks so much both. for having me. Thank you. Thank and thank you to everyone tuning in from home. You can find all the books discussed in today's panel at our virtual bookstore in partnership with Another Story Bookshop and our official ebook seller, Rakuten Kobo. You have until the final day of the festival to sign up for our giveaway in partnership with Rakuten Kobo. Visit toronto.thewordonthestreet.ca slash 2021-festival-contest 
for your chance to win one of three special prizes, including a new Kobo e-reader. Remember, for each day of the festival you tune in, we'll announce one bonus entry code. And today's bonus entry code is only hope, all is one word. We'll be back tomorrow starting at 2 p.m. with our panel Murder She Wrote, Family, Truth, and Social Justice, discussing women writers in the genre of mystery with Dorothy Ellen Palmer, Sheena Kamal, Andrea Gunraj, and Angela Mystery. For your information about this year's lineup, as well as the panelists you've heard today, visit our website, toronto.wordonthestreet.ca. If you'd like support, if you'd like to support The Word on the Street by making a donation, simply head to our website and click Donate Now at the top of the homepage. Thanks again for joining us, everybody. Have a great night.